These are five major problems with the belief in the rapture. Now, the idea of a rapture is something that's really popular today, at least in popular culture, and we hear about this all the time, that somebody has predicted uh, that the end of the world is going to happen, that the rapture is going to happen. We've seen it in the popularity of the Left Behind books and the movies, and then the remake of the first movie. And while I think that this idea of the rapture is something that seems to be slowly dying out within uh, American evangelicalism, it's not as popular as it was at one time, it's still really popular in certain groups. And I run to people in my ministry all the time that talk about the rapture. So this is a major question that a lot of people have uh, about this idea of the rapture. Does the Bible teach this? Uh, does the Bible teach that there is this there is this coming of Christ, which is in secret and a quiet one where everybody will just kind of disappear and then our clothes will be neatly folded on the ground, right? That's what happens in Left Behind. Um, it's kind of like what happens in Star Wars, right? When the Jedi disappear, their clothing is left behind. Uh, that's that's how this picture of the rapture is. And uh, so we have this idea that Jesus comes once, everybody disappears that believes. We have a seven-year tribulation that kind of changes halfway through. The tribulation gets worse. And uh, then Jesus will come a second time time after the end of that uh, seven-year tribulation. And I don't believe in the rapture. Uh, I'm a Lutheran pastor, and uh, in our church tradition, we, we do not believe that the rapture is something that is biblical. It's never been a part of our tradition. And so those of you who are curious about this topic or looking for resources or information on this topic, uh, here are an outline of just five of the reasons why we don't believe in this idea of a secret rapture. Now, the first reason is because it's not historic Christian teaching. And after this, we're going to get into the biblical text themselves, but I wanted to start with this. Uh, and that is that, that Christians in general throughout the centuries have not read the Bible in this way. And they've been reading the same text that we have, but they didn't see the kind of reading that we have today that seems to teach something like a secret rapture. So this view was really popularized uh, in the 1830s by a man named John Nelson Darby. Now, Darby was the founder, often considered the founder of, of what's called dispensationalism, which is a different way of reading the Bible than Christians had practiced uh, in the past. And that was that there's an understanding that the nation of Israel and the church have two very different covenants, promises that are given to them. And God works differently in these different dispensations or these different periods of, of time. Uh, and there is a covenant that was given to Abraham, which is specifically an eth ethnic national covenant for the people of Israel. And then there's what's called the parentheses or the time period of the church. Now we have promises that are applied to the church, but there's this big divorce between national ethnic Israel and then the promises that are given to the church. And within this scheme, uh, there were all these particular ideas about the end times that, that Darby talked about. And one of those was that there was gonna be a seven year tribulation. And prior to that seven year tribulation, there was going to be a rapture where those who believe would secretly disappear with Christ into the clouds. Now, that idea was then popularized following John Nelson Darby, and by the early 20th century, it became really popular, especially through the Schofield Reference Bible, to the point where a lot of Christians eventually just became convinced that, hey, this is just what Christians believe about this issue. But it's really not the historic Christian teaching. Now, some people have claimed that there are, uh, you know, a couple precursors to dispensationalism in the history of the church. Um, there were a couple radical Franciscans that taught something like a rapture, at least some have argued that way. Um, but it certainly was a very, very, very tiny percentage of people that read the Bible that way, if you can find any at all. And for the most part, it really is a view that didn't show up until the 19th century. Now, that doesn't mean it's wrong. Maybe everybody has read the Bible wrong until these people came along. But that should really cause us to, I think, start to question things and say, well, did everybody really get it wrong until John Nelson Darby? Or maybe was he wrong in how he was understanding this, the scripture? These are five major problems with the belief in the rapture. Now, 
The idea of a rapture is something that's really popular today, at least in popular culture, and we hear about this all the time, that somebody has predicted uh, that the end of the world is going to happen, that the rapture is going to happen. We've seen it in the popularity of the Left Behind books and the movies, and then the remake of the first movie. And while I think that this idea of the rapture is something that seems to be slowly dying out within uh, American evangelicalism, it's not as popular as it was at one time, it's still really popular in certain groups. And I run into people in my ministry all the time that talk about the rapture. So this is a major question that a lot of people have uh, about this idea of the rapture. Does the Bible teach this? Uh, does the Bible teach that there is this there is this coming of Christ, which is in secret and a quiet one where everybody will just kind of disappear and then our clothes will be neatly folded on the ground, right? That's what happens in Left Behind. Um, it's kind of like what happens in Star Wars, right? When the Jedi disappear, their clothing is left behind. Uh, that's that's how this picture of the rapture is. And uh, so we have this idea that Jesus comes once, everybody disappears that believes. We have a seven-year tribulation that kind of changes halfway through. The tribulation gets worse. And uh, then Jesus will come a second time time after the end of that uh, seven-year tribulation. And I don't believe in the rapture. Uh, I'm a Lutheran pastor, and uh, in our church tradition, we, we do not believe that the rapture is something that is biblical. It's never been a part of our tradition. And so those of you who are curious about this topic or looking for resources or information on this topic, uh, here are an outline of just five of the reasons why we don't believe in this idea of a secret rapture. Now, the first reason is because it's not historic Christian teaching. And after this, we're going to get into the biblical text themselves, but I wanted to start with this. Uh, and that is that, that Christians in general throughout the centuries have not read the Bible in this way. And they've been reading the same text that we have, but they didn't see the kind of reading that we have today that seems to teach something like a secret rapture. So this view was really popularized uh, in the 1830s by a man named John Nelson Darby. Now, Darby was the founder, often considered the founder of, of what's called dispensationalism, which is a different way of reading the Bible than Christians had practiced uh, in the past. And that was that there's an understanding that the nation of Israel and the church have two very different covenants promises that are given to them. And God works differently in these different dispensations or these different periods of, of time. Uh, and there is a covenant that was given to Abraham, which is specifically an eth ethnic national covenant for the people of Israel. And then there's what's called the parentheses or the time period of the church. Now we have promises that are applied to the church, but there's this big divorce between national ethnic Israel and then the promises that are given to the church. And within this scheme, uh, there were all these particular ideas about the end times that, that Darby talked about. And one of those was that there's going to be a seven year tribulation. And prior to that seven-year tribulation, there was going to be a rapture where those who believe would secretly disappear with Christ into the clouds. Now, that idea was then popularized following John Nelson Darby, and by the early 20th century, it became really popular, especially through the Schofield Reference Bible, to the point where a lot of Christians eventually just became convinced that, hey, this is just what Christians believe about this issue, but it's really not the historic Christian teaching. Now, some people have claimed that there are, uh, you know, a couple precursors to dispensationalism in the history of the church. Um, there were a couple radical Franciscans that taught something like a rapture, at least some have argued that way, um, but it certainly was a very, very, very tiny percentage of people that read the Bible that way, if you can find any at all. And for the most part, it really is a view that didn't show up until the 19th century. Now, that doesn't mean it's wrong. Maybe everybody has read the Bible wrong until these people came along. But that should really cause us to, I think, start to question things and say, well, did everybody really get it wrong until John Nelson Darby? Or maybe was he wrong in how he was understanding this, the scripture? The second reason is because 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, a text which is often thought to be about the rapture, actually teaches a very loud and public coming of Christ rather than a secret one. And I'm going to read uh, this from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through uh, 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout 
with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Now in this text, we are told uh, that we will meet the Lord in the air. And this shows up even in a lot of popular songs coming out of the 1970s uh, when this idea of the rapture got really popular in certain evangelical circles. You know, this, this idea of being caught up together with the Lord in the clouds. And certainly we are caught up together in the Lord in the clouds with the Lord. That's what scripture very clearly says. But what does that mean? And do we have any reason in this text to think that this is a first secret coming of Jesus, which precedes his second coming? And in the text, he really doesn't speak in that way because what he does is he talks about the visible nature of it. It's loud and he says it's going to be with the call of the trumpet of God and it's going to be like with the uh, the voice of an archangel. None of this has the, the implications that this is going to be something secret. This certainly doesn't sound like it's something that's quiet. The people are just going to disappear. This is about the victorious Jesus descending onto the earth with such a loud noise and a trumpet call. All see him, and then the dead are raised, and we are caught up together with him in the clouds. This doesn't appear to be a secret event. Um, it's really hard to see that in this text at all. Uh, so when we look at this text in context, there's just no reason to think it teaches a secret rapture. And as you continue read into chapter 5, this is then uh, called the day of the Lord, this day when, when all people are gathered together with Christ, when his people are gathered together with him in heaven. And the day of the Lord is, is a phrase that's used often through the Old Testament as well as in the New, and the day of the Lord uh, just refers to that day of Christ's coming. Uh, and, and there's no one day of the Lord where Jesus comes secretly, then a second day of the Lord when Jesus comes publicly. All of this here is just wrapped up together as one event. The third reason is because Luke chapter 17 does not speak about God's people ascending into the air, um, but something very different when we actually look at the context. Now, what we're going to talk about is Luke chapter 17, and this starts in verse uh, 22 when Jesus is talking about the end, and we've got uh, some phrases that are really, really popular when you're talking about dispensationalism, when you're getting into some ideas about uh, the rapture. Um, now, let me see. I will read, for example, um, verse 31. In that day, he who was on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down and take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, in that night, there will be two men. Okay, this is the part that people talk about all the time. In one bed, the one will be taken and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding together. The one will be taken and the other left. Two men will be in the field, the one taken and the other left. Now, this is often thought uh, as an example of what's going on with the rapture. So we've got these situations where we've got women working together, men working together. One disappears, the other stays on the earth. And the way that, that those who believe in the rapture understand this text is that what's going on here is that those who are taken are the faithful. These are those who are raptured, taken up into the secret rapture. Now, certainly if you just read those texts, you know, you can understand where that's coming from. Um, but if you look at the broader context of what's actually going on in this text, it really seems to teach quite the opposite. And, and that is that there is a connection being made here. Before he gets into those examples, he said, it's going to be like the days of Noah, and it's going to be like the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, in the days of Noah, here's the question. Who are those who are left on the earth? And who are those who are taken? Well, I think it's pretty clear that those who are left are actually Noah and his family. And those who are taken are those who are swept away by the waters of the flood. Those who are taken in Sodom and Gomorrah are those who are destroyed by God's wrath through fire and brimstone, as it talks about. And those who are left are the people who survived, Lot, who was left on the earth. And so it really teaches quite the opposite. So I think you're, you're getting the wrong understanding here to say, well, those who are taken are the faithful and those who are left are the wicked who are going to be destroyed. Uh, when in fact, in the examples, it seems pretty clear that actually what's being taught is in the flood, those who were taken were taken by the flood of God's wrath. Those who were left were known as family who were left by the saving power of God's work as they were brought into, into the ark. 
Um, so we can't read this text as proof of the rapture. It simply doesn't talk about any kind of secret coming of Jesus. It doesn't say it's those who are faithful who are going to depart. It doesn't say that they will depart by going up into the air. Those who remain then will face God's wrath as it's poured out on the earth through the seven-year tribulation. None of that is actually taught here. Now, the fourth reason is from the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, this is a great text. It's one that gets into a lot of detail about uh, the resurrection of the dead and not Jesus, not just Jesus' resurrection, but also the resurrection that all of his people are going to partake in. So it gives us a lot of details about exactly what's going to happen on the last day. And when it does that, Paul does not give any indication that there are two comings of Jesus. And this would be the place he would do it, right? Because he's explaining this is what the resurrection is all about. It doesn't say first Jesus comes for these people, there's the secret rapture, then he comes again seven years later. But instead he just speaks about one event. There's one event, Jesus comes, resurrection, that's it. There's no indication that these two things can be divided. Uh, in verse 50 uh, of chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, now this I say, brethren, the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. And some people say, yes, at the twinkling of an eye, this is the rapture. Well, this is speaking about the last trumpet. This, this is speaking about this very loud, very clear, singular event. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruption has put on incorruption, and the mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying it is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades, where is your victory? There simply is just not, Paul's not working with the categories of two comings of Jesus. He's just not. And there's no indication of that here. Surely if he believed that, this would have showed up, it would have been a little more clear. You have to really read so much into the text to get that idea out of it. And I think when, when you look at this, it's very obvious that Paul's just expecting Jesus comes, loud trumpet, everybody knows, resurrection, that's it. That's all he gives room for. There's no indication of anything else going on here at all. The fifth and final reason is because when Jesus is giving the Olivet Discourse and he's speaking in the Gospels about the end, he does not give any indication that there will be two comings of, of himself when he returns. He only speaks about one singular coming. For example, we can look at Mark chapter 13, verse 24. But in those days after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars of heaven will fall, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory and he will send his angels, gather his elect from the four winds, from the farthest parts of the earth and the farthest part of heaven. And so he only speaks about this single coming. And he doesn't say before the tribulation, Jesus comes, then there's this tribulation, which is the seven year period. Then he's going to come back. No, Jesus just says the son of man is going to come. There's going to be the, the same things that we see every time. We, we see this very visible thing coming down. He's coming down from the sky. All of God's people are gathered together, and that's it. That's the end. And we see this throughout. Uh, Jesus never differentiates and at any point says, well, first I'm going to do this, then I'm going to do this. What people have to do is take certain passages where Jesus says he's coming, other passages where Jesus says he's coming, and then say, well, these passages talk about one coming and these talk about another. But never does he indicate anywhere specifically in the text that there are two comings. It's something that really the reader has to do in looking at these texts and say, well, they have to be two different things, and you can't find it in the text itself. So these are just a few of, of the reasons. These are just five reasons. Um, there's a lot more. We could get into every single text that talks about the rapture. Um, I'm not going to do that because this is just a short YouTube video. Um, but these are just some of the basic reasons. If you're curious about this issue, trying to figure out um, what, what the rapture is all about, out, what Lutherans think about the rapture, what you should think about the rapture, um, and look at scripture and test what I say by the word of God and see if it says what I'm telling you that it says. Don't trust me, but 
but but read God's word. And I think it's pretty clear on this issue. So I hope you liked this video. If you uh, are interested in videos like this on biblical stuff, theological issues, please like, comment, and subscribe down below. It'll help me out a lot. Also, you can become a patron by uh, signing up with Patreon and just giving me a little bit of money each month. Uh, and that's not for a salary for me or anything like that. Um, that's really for resources for me to be able to continue doing this stuff, including my podcast and blog and other things. So if you're interested in giving a little bit that will help, uh, please do that. If not, that's okay too. Just watch and enjoy and share. Thanks. We'll see you next time. God bless.